right. So, yeah, um, Steve did a little introduction there. I've been a journalist for a lot longer than 17 years. 17 years is uh, how long I spent with Reuters, but uh, it's actually been about 30 years as a professional journalist. Um, I spent a lot of my career early on covering the banking industry. Um, I thought that was, you know, the most important industry, you know, the high finance and uh, big uh, wheeling and dealing going on. And, uh, but Reuters asked me in 1998 if I would move to Kansas and start writing about food and agriculture. And I thought that sounded like a really horrible idea. Um, but uh, my father lived there and there were some family considerations and I thought, I'll give it a try. So, uh, you know, switched out my blue business suits and high heels for blue jeans and mud boots and moved to Kansas and uh, started really trying to dig in and learn everything I could about uh, agriculture and food, how we grow our food, uh, and who the really big companies were that were controlling this industry and making a big difference. Uh, and as you know, in 1998, or maybe you don't know, in 1998, when I took on this assignment for Reuters, Monsanto was really changing the way that our food system uh, was, was done, the way that food was grown here in the U.S., because they had just introduced genetically engineered crops. And these genetically engineered crops were designed to do primarily one thing, and that was to encourage the use of Monsanto's Roundup, uh, this weed killer that Monsanto had developed and patented in the 1970s. And the patent was about to expire, and Monsanto was looking to keep a hold on that market share and really encourage the use. And, and so this was a really profound change for modern agriculture, and it was something that I needed to understand and learn about. I needed to uh, understand about Monsanto's rivals, Dow and DuPont, and how they were reshaping modern agriculture. So I spent a lot of time inside Monsanto's headquarters. Um, you know, they were very eager to teach me um, what they were doing and how and why. Spent a lot of time inside DuPont. I've uh, traversed literally hundreds, I'm thinking maybe thousands of farm fields over these last 20 or so years, um, row crop farmers, uh, vegetable specialty crop growers. And, it, and it's given me a, a couple of things. One is I now realize that it's not banking that's the most important industry, it's, it's food, it's agriculture. We all eat, uh, right? And the food that we eat and how it's grown and how it affects our environment and how it affects our health, I mean, there is no more profound um, issue, I, I, I believe. Uh, and the other thing that I've learned is that I think that we've created a really um, dangerous problem for ourselves because what we have, uh, have created and accepted is a pesticide-dependent food system. Uh, this has been driven by a handful of companies. You know, they are telling us that we don't need to worry about any risks, that we should just accept or, or deny or turn away uh, from what health experts are telling us. And we should just accept that, that, you know, the rewards are well worth the risks. Uh, because these chemicals help farmers, you know, fight weeds and bugs and plant diseases. Uh, and they tell us that, you know, we need these pesticides to feed the world. But, of course, the health experts, medical scientists, and others have been warning for years uh, that we are, in fact, endangering uh, our health now and the health of our future generations. So that's what led me to write the book Whitewash, uh, and, I, and that's what has led me to you know, do some speaking, is I really want people to be aware of these risks. Uh, and if I can get my little clicker to work, we will move forward. Oh, great, it's working. Um, so one thing I like to, to do is just start out with a little, what is a pesticide? Uh, I get so many emails from people saying, boy, are you stupid, you don't understand a weed killer is not a pesticide. And I just want to point out, for regulatory and legal purposes, a weed killer is a pesticide. So we can just move on, hopefully. <laughs> and I won't get those angry emails. So these are what I call some not-so-fun facts. Uh, there are over about a billion pounds of pesticides in the United States are used uh, each year. This is according to government data. About 5.6 billion pounds are used each year worldwide. USDA estimates about 50 million Americans get their drinking water um, from groundwater that's potentially contaminated uh, with pesticides and other agricultural chemicals. A lot of nitrates uh, in a lot of water supplies. You may have read about that. It's a very big problem. Uh, and of course, as I've already mentioned, research, we care about this because research ties pesticides to a range of health problems. 
uh, reproductive and neuro neurodevelopmental problems as well as kidney liver diseases and uh, cancers. Did it click? Did it change? Yes, great, all right. Um, so cancer in particular, and this has become very, uh, I don't know, something that I'm, I've been really focused on. Uh, a year ago, a good friend of mine um, died of cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer. And, and so I started really looking into the cancer statistics a little more deeply and, and saw that our, our government now tells us that roughly 39% of men and women in the United States will get cancer in their lifetimes. And maybe that doesn't shock you. It sure shocks me. Um, but I look around and I know, I mean, the neighbor down the street and the, the woman across the street and my son's 16-year-old friend on the football team. You know, cancer is becoming so common in our lives. And if you look to our National Toxicology Program, um, our NIEHS, um, our, our government scientists are telling us that we are creating this toxic environment. And, and the result is cancer. We have, of course, genetic predispositions and other issues, but the toxins in our environment, the contaminants, are known to be contributing to these cancers. And pesticides are a big part of that problem. And you can see some of the statistics I've put up here. Uh, in this 2016 National Toxicology Program, I thought they made a really great point when they said, you know, we're getting cancer. It's becoming so common that we're not shocked by it anymore. We're being told to take a pill or get radiated or cut off a body part, but why don't we focus on trying to prevent it? Why don't we, why don't we put resources into that? And one of, one of the key um, elements to that, of course, is education and information. And again, that's part of what I'm trying to do with whitewash. So common exposure routes to pesticides. Uh, right, we have dermal, this is sort of through the skin. If you're out spraying it or near someone who's spraying it or there's aerial spraying going on, it can be absorbed through your skin. Inhalation, same kind of thing, you can inhale it. I tend to think of these exposures uh, and describe them as more voluntary. Uh, you know, you can see the plane flying overhead. Uh, you might be spraying it yourself out in your yard. Um, but another really big exposure is dietary. And I don't think that is necessarily voluntary. I don't know that people understand how prevalent pesticides are now in our diet, in our food, and in our, in our drinking water. So this is, um, I pulled this from a recent FDA report. This came out this fall. The FDA every year for more than 30 years uh, has put out these annual reports. And, and it's part of their job. It's also part of the USDA's job to do this, to look at food. Uh, and measure the pesticide residues in commonly consumed foods and to report on that. Uh, now, an interesting part of this is that they don't generally include glyphosate, which is Monsanto's you know, very profitable chemical and uh, you know, the most widely used herbicide in the world, but we'll get to that later. Um, but you can see here in these numbers, the blue bars um, are the categories of foods uh, that have these pesticide residues. And so you can see in fruits, 77.8% of fruits carry pesticide residues in this latest FDA report. Roughly 50% of vegetables. Uh, grains have a high percentage, a high prevalence of pesticides found in them. The red marks are those, are those that are considered illegal. Uh, levels that are considered illegal, and they're very, very small. And so our government and the companies that sell these chemicals say, see, you don't have to worry. They're not illegal. Um, they don't tell you uh, that the levels that are set as being legal or illegal um, are largely set by the companies. They go to the EPA and they say, here's where we want these levels to be, and they talk to the EPA about all of these reasons, and, uh, and these levels have been rising steadily, and I will talk about that again Later, but what was considered legal for a particular pesticide in our food 20 years ago, uh, it's now much higher. They're allowing ever higher levels into our food. Hope I'm doing this right. Is that? Yes. So I want to talk just briefly or point out, you know, glyphosate, I already mentioned, it's a weed killer. It's uh, brought to the market by Monsanto. 
It's used in Roundup and hundreds of other products. Um, it's connected, been connected in research to cancer, kidney and liver problems, as well as some reproductive problems, some um, bad birth outcomes. Atrazine is another very commonly used herbicide that's found in our food and, and particularly in our water. Uh, it's been associated through scientific study with birth defects, uh, low fetal birth weight, uh, reduced survival, again, um, bad birth outcomes. And then chlorpyrifos, I don't know, are there any nerds out there? Do we know chlorpyrifos? No? Yes? Uh, chlorpyrifos is an insecticide that's made a lot of money for Dow Chemical and some other companies. Uh, it's been shown pretty definitively to impair uh, brain development, to be neurodevelopmentally damaging to children. And the science is so strong and definitive on this that it's been banned from household use. And it was supposed to be banned uh, in uh, 2017 from all food use in agriculture. Dow Chemical went and met with the new Trump administration and uh, gave a million dollars to the Trump inaugural fund. And, and uh, that ban went away, um, or at least was put on hold. Thank you.